All right, it's 11 o'clock on the dot, and we're getting started because it's Melissa's Sunday with Children's Church, and you have a tendency to preach a little longer on those Sundays, so we're going to get started right on 11 o'clock, and I'm going to try not to go too far over. I might have got out of my system. Poor Miss Pam. I'd apologize to her Sunday night. I was like, I'm sorry. Uh, don't go long when you're preaching when it's a full moon. That's just a wrong thing to do to people handling the children's sermon. So, uh, but those ladies are great, and they every month they they do it like truth. So, uh, announcements: read your Bible. I will submit it or send out another. Well, we started another one for Romans, um, and I'll send out another one for the youth. I'll try to do that later today. They'll start tomorrow. Uh, so, just be in the Word as much as you can. Uh, next, school prayer. Uh, last week. The prayer went out on Thursday online instead of Tuesday, but uh, we talked about love as a fruit of the spirit that we wanted to be evident at our school. This week, we're going to pray for joy. Um, so many of our kids, for whatever reason, it's hard for them to have joy because of circumstances in their life. The other thing we want to do is make sure that we're modeling what true joy looks like. If kids look to us as their parents or the staff at the school or whatever, and they see that our life is going up and down based on what we have or don't have or other things in this world, they're going to think we're, that's where happiness is. But if they see us having true joy because of our relationship with Christ, that's something that's going to hopefully influence them. So just pray that joy will be present and will be modeled, especially by those of us that are adults and around those kids regularly. Uh, next. This Wednesday, we're going to... That picture didn't show up very well. Um, we're going to look at the parable of the wicked tenants in Mark 12. Of course, the idea being that the... The vineyard owner leases out the vineyard. Um, in other words, the people working the vineyard don't own it, but they try to seize control of it for themselves. Our life itself, the things we have in this life, are they really ours? Or do they belong to God? But yet we'll still try to seize control of them, right? And so that parable has a lot to teach us about how we view life and what we've been given and whether or not we consider things from the, the, the eternal perspective the way we should. Uh, so we'll look at that, and uh, I think we're going to have barbecue chicken. Is that right? Barbecue chicken uh, Wednesday night at 6.30, and then we'll have our time of uh, fellowship and study and prayer at uh, 7. Next, fostering community. We're continuing to do that collection. Uh, they've taken the stuff uh, and given it to them for the month of February to distribute at the end of February, beginning of March, and so we've started a new collection. So if you brought something last month, just bring it again this month, and we'll continue to do this. Like I said, I've, I've been reaching out to other churches to see if they'd be willing to partner with us so that we could all kind of specialize and narrow down what it is we're bringing and they could focus on something. Uh, as that happens, I'll let you know so that we can hopefully whittle our list down and focus on just a few things instead of instead of bringing everything. But I'll keep you updated with that. And if you have any questions about it, see Miss Claudia, who has her hand raised, uh, and, or Jean. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when we took the to them, they're going to talk to them about that and they're going to give us um, a list this week of a smaller, more condensed list. Okay. And uh, so if y'all want to hold off until next week, um, check with Jeff Wolfman. We have a, a different list. Okay. So hold off because they're going to give us a smaller, condensed list, and I will we'll post that list out there, and I'll try to get it the bulletin for next Sunday. So we've got all 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 all, all, all March uh, to get that stuff. So you can hold off a week. Uh, next. Photo directory. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be taking pictures again. Again, it's every other Sunday. The Sundays that Nathan is off and available to take them here. So we had several take them last Sunday. A few took them the Sunday before. Uh, obviously, not everybody can do it at the same time. But, uh, you know, if you want to go ahead and do it, that'd be great. We want to go ahead and get as many done each week as we can because it'll take a while doing it every other week. So, again, don't make me Google and look for a picture of you. There's a picture of you somewhere, um, at least someone with your name. So if you want if you want us to see you um, and you want to choose, uh, then go ahead and get that picture taken. Don't let me go searching for stuff off the internet. Larry Miles did that to me for an article I wrote for Word and Word. He just pulled up uh, Larry. If you're watching, I forgive you. He just screenshotted a picture of me, and I'm like, oh, I, yeah, I was like, I got to get you another picture, all right? <laughs> so uh, don't make me do that to you. Um, so get your picture taken. If not next week, then soon. Next. Youth gathering next Sunday night, 7 p.m. over in the FAC. Of course, it's March, which there's always St. Patrick's Day. And with St. Patrick's Day comes a lot of talk about luck and four-leaf clovers. And so we're going to talk about what is luck? What is providence? Is life just about, well, you had bad luck, you had good luck? Or are there parts of life where um, God guides things? 
just the story we looked at this morning, the young adult class, the story of Joseph. Um, a lot of people would look at that and say, well, Joseph had some real bad luck. Brothers turned on him, got accused of something he didn't even do and thrown in prison for it in Egypt. But you'll notice something. It says, immediately after he got thrown into prison, wrongfully accused and wrongfully punished for something, it says, but God was with him. And God eventually uses all those series of events to use Joseph to be the savior of not only Egypt, but his own family back in Israel, in Canaan. And so you see that sometimes we see things as bad luck or good luck, but there is the hand of God in things. And God can, can bring good things out of bad things. I think about that verse from Romans. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And Joseph's life is like a, a test case for that. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how, how is our life just full of luck, good luck, bad luck, or is God ordering things? And is there a way for us to see even the bad things in life as something that God might possibly bring good out of? So we're going to talk about that next Sunday night in our youth gathering, uh, 7 o'clock over the uh, FAC. Um, next. Good Friday at Indian Creek. Uh, we've done this the last few years. We're going to do it again. I'll give you uh, a little more detail in terms of times in the next few weeks. But uh, Good Friday is March 29th. And so we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. We're going to have dinner out there. And we're going to have a time of worship where we simply read the story of the crucifixion, sing some hymns that go along with that, really reflect on uh, what Good Friday means, the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. Of course, we've been talking a lot about that the last few weeks in our sermon series, uh, The Cross. And today we're going to continue talking about that. The cross is the power of God. But we're going to read through that story. And it's funny, the first week of this sermon series, I had several people comment on, I needed to hear that. And it was interesting. I did less talking and did more reading of scripture. Funny how that works, right? I just read, remember Mark 15? And I think what I took away from that is we've read a lot about the cross, but sometimes it's good just to sit down and read the story of the cross in its entirety and be reminded of everything that Christ did for us. And so we're going to do that together at Indian Creek on Good Friday. Uh, like I said, I'll give you more details, specifics about times uh, in the weeks to come. And also remember in just a few weeks, it'll be two weeks from today. Uh, I, I don't know if I put it in the bulletin. I know I don't have a slide for it yet. The water project will begin those two weeks before Easter. Uh, we kind of make a pact. Those of us that want to participate that we're going to give up drinking anything but water and use all that money that we saved off of the, the Cokes from the store or the coffees. Oh, that's going to be hard. Uh, and we use all that to um, donate to people that dig uh, waters to provide, uh, dig waters, dig wells to provide water for people in poor parts of the world. Uh, and I was just reflecting on that. Like, we'll spend two weeks thinking about how much we sacrifice by drinking nothing but water. Meanwhile, there's other people in other parts of the world that would love to just be able to drink water clean water and not worry about what they're getting, what they're being infected with because they're drinking for some brackish pond or some nasty something. Like we really are blessed. And that's the two weeks that reminds me of how blessed we are because the things that I think are sacrifices are things that other people never be able to dream of. Um, next, two other things I need to mention that are, that are, I think they're in the bulletin, but I just want to point them out to you. Well, I know this one's not bulletin. Time change next week. It always creeps up on me. Spring forward. It's the bad one. So you're going to lose an hour of sleep next next Saturday night. So just remember that. Remember, a lot of times your phones do it automatically. But if you're a um, a person that's suspicious of technology like I am, I always have an analog clock, too, just so I can see if my phone has switched. Um, see, if y'all miss one Sunday, it's that big a deal. But if everybody shows up, the preacher ain't here, then everybody's going to know that I've messed up my time change thing. So uh, it became, time change became a lot more stressful when I entered this line of work. Uh, also, I put it in the bulletin, but I keep forgetting to make a slide. There's a ladies' day coming up at Pineville. If you're interested in going, all the details for it are in the bulletin. So just look. It's got the time. It's got all that other stuff in there. Um, so just keep your bulletin with you, and that will give you all the information you need. I think the theme is something to do with hospitality, and it's T-E-A, like Southern Tea. I thought it was very clever. But all the details for that are in the bulletin. Now, if you'll stand, uh, we'll read Psalm 19 together before we begin our worship. The heavens tell of the glory of God, and their expanse declares the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is like a groom coming out of his chamber, 
It rejoices like a strong person to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much pure gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, your servant is warned by them. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep your servant back from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be innocent, and I will be blameless of great wrongdoing. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's worship God together. <clears throat> praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Sing over this wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor, give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries him all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals, glad with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord be called. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. You may be seated. Invaded high and holy lays, my soul a grateful voice would raise. For who can sing the worthy praise of the wonderful love of Jesus? Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love. Wonderful love of Jesus, a joy by day, a peace by night, in storms of calm, in darkness light, in pain of love, in weakness light, is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love. Of Jesus, wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of 
Jesus. My hope for pardon, where I call, my trust for lifting, where I fall. In my faith and my all in all is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son. And leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name of all beings, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, for sin. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son, and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face, there I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son, and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. We're going to sing this song uh, before we uh, gather around the table. And we've been talking about the cross the last several weeks, uh, sermon series, looking at different passages. Uh, but the cross is not only something uh, that Jesus does for us, and that's what we remember when we gather around the table, but it's also a way of law, life for us. Uh, Jesus tells us, if anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross daily and follow me. So before we gather around the table, let's sing this song. Um, and let's think about not only what Christ has done for us, but how have we been walking in that way of life that he calls us to live. Uh, if you will, let's stand before we sing this song. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall bear inside of the gates of life, bear the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home, the way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. I must needs go on in the blood sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights of one where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world, to walk 
give it nevermore. For my Lord says, Come, and I seek my home, where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home, the whole way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Gather here around this table to look at these <laughs> emblems that represent the body of our Lord and Savior. <coughs> As he hung on that cross, we need to be mindful of a great sacrifice that was given for us, even though we do not deserve it, but given for the redemption of our sins. As we partake of these emblems, let's do so in a pleasing manner. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for every blessing you send our way. So many we don't even see. We thank you above all for the blessing of having received hope of life eternal through the sacrifice that Jesus made by leaving home in heaven to come to this earth taking on a body that he freely gave that we might indeed know him and learn from him and gain eternal life through his life. Be with us as we partake of this unleavened bread, which represents his broken body, the body that he gave to go to the cross. Help us to be mindful of all the wonderful blessings that are flowing and that every individual can come to know Christ and have the hope of life eternal because of that sacrifice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>
fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed and has both. Would you ask the blessings? Father, we truly do thank you that we're able to gather here to remember our Lord and Savior. We do ask, Father, that you will cause us to find joy in knowing that our sins have been covered by the blood of your precious Lamb. Help us, Father, as we partake of this cup, that we will remember all that he did for us, in suffering and dying and shedding his blood, so that we might be reconciled to you. <laughs> we ask, Father, that you'll bless this cup and bless all of us to partake of it. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Apart from the taking of the hymn of the Lord's table, we take this time as an opportunity to return a portion of our earnings. Been blessed in different ways by our Lord Savior. We return a portion of these blessings and ask Daniel to ask the blessings on this gift. Our dear Father, thank you for this day that we can come and see your work, dear Father. Thank you for your son and you paid the ultimate sacrifice for the life away of our sins. Uh, 
And uh, thank you for all the things that you have uh, most graciously uh, blessed us with uh, at this time. Allow us to get back a portion of that and to serve your will. In your church, holy name. Amen. <coughs> All right, we're going to take this time to go over prayer requests. Uh, before we do, I'm going to dismiss the kids, seven and under. There's one right there. Uh, looking at our prayer request list, uh, we've got several who are doing better, who have been ill, so grateful for that. Uh, we've got recent requests. Uh, Luck at Shockley, uh, down on his back, to be praying for him that he'll be healed. Also, a uh, recent request, we've got Scott Easley, who has a test coming up Tuesday, tomorrow, tomorrow. So we're praying for that. Also, Bill Gunner, Tim Drotty, uh, Mason Borderline and her baby, uh, Jamie Shraven, Luther Paul, Hunter Anderson, Clifton Peters, uh, Kevin, Madison Shadrick and her baby, uh, Lacey Ham. We've got several others on that list. Um, so just be mindful of them. If you have any updates on them, please let us know uh, so we can update it. Um, we pray for those on the continuing list. Um, we got some that are, you know, like Matt uh, Third, um, who's recovering from knee surgery, uh, going through rehab for that. Uh, so just be praying for all those on that list. Also, those deployed in the military, um, those cancer patients. We've added some to that list in the last few weeks, and some on that list have, have faced surgeries or, or pending surgeries. So just be praying for them. Also, those in the nursing homes. I know Flo Conway on our list. She's been put in hospice, so be praying for her as well as QA and his sister Faye. Uh, all those who are traveling, all those who have lost loved ones. Um, most recently, we got the family of Devin Perkins, young man that was killed down there around Oakdale um, in a car wreck. Um, also, the families of Harold McDonald, uh, Miss Carol and her family, the passing of Jared, uh, Robert Melder family, and the Gus Delegatitis family. Is there anyone else we need to add to the list? Or you can take Jamie off. He came back from the doctor, and apparently there's no problem. The first doctor was. Just completely off base. And then can you add Rick McGuffey? Rick McGuffey. And yeah, he's having issues with his knees. He's in the hospital and he's going back on Monday to get the really drawn off of it. McGuffey. M C C M C G U Oh McGuffey. F F E E. Gotcha. Well, that's good news about Jamie. I know he's anxious when you gotta go get a second opinion. Um well, that's why it's good to get one so that it turns out you're not dying. They read it wrong. So <clears throat> and uh, Carl Chalet, he had a uh, in my metal level originally found on. Okay. Carl Chalet. Any others? All right, if not, let's stand. Uh, Stephen, would you mind uh, leading us in prayer? <laughs>
comes to us and, and gives us a, ch us a chance for eternity with you. We ask now that all these uh, names and issues that were mentioned here this morning that we know we, we can't remember all of them, but you know each one and as you see those according to uh, be with us as we go continue through the service, be with Justin as he brings the message and uh, if you watch over us through the service, drop in and pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Continuing our focus on the cross uh, this morning, we're going to look at the cross of Christ is God's power. And our text will be 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. At the heart of this passage... This morning, there are two questions. What is true wisdom and what is true power? If we get those things wrong, we're likely to get a lot of other things wrong. But if we rightly understand what wisdom is and what power is, then we'll notice that a lot of other things begin to fall into place. Because the truth is, the world will offer us other definitions. Counterfeit wisdom, counterfeit power. And so we asked the question this morning, what is true wisdom? What is true power? The Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. Maybe you know someone named Sophia. Maybe she realizes it, maybe she doesn't, but her name means wisdom. One of the most famous structures in not only the history of Christianity, but by the history of the world is a church that was built in what used to be Constantinople. It's now Istanbul. The church actually still remains. It's been the church. It's no longer a church. I think it's actually a museum. For a long time after it was a church, after the Muslims conquered Turkey, it became a, a mosque. But it was called Hagia Sophia, which means holy wisdom. It was the largest church um, with a vaulted domed ceiling. That it, it was the largest domed ceiling that had ever been constructed at that time. I believe it was the Emperor Justinian that built it. But he built this church and he named it after holy wisdom. An acknowledgement that there is a unholy wisdom. There is a wisdom that is according to the world, not according to God. I mentioned Sophia, that word for wisdom, because it's used 17 times in 1 Corinthians. And all the rest of Paul's letters, 11. So that's a major thing. <laughs> Paul wrote about 13 letters, depending on how you look at Hebrews, maybe 14. 13 letters, and of those, now some are shorter than others, let's be clear, Philemon, not a lot of words in that period. But wisdom, 17 times in 1 Corinthians. All 12 other letters, 11 times. And of those times that Paul uses this word wisdom, 16 of those are in the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians, where he's trying to hash out what it means that Jesus died on the cross, the true content of the gospel. That word wisdom keeps being used over and over again towards the front end of this letter. And if you know anything about the Corinthians, they were a fractious, contentious lot for a church. <laughs> and so it's interesting that Paul's writing to probably one of his more problematic churches 
Paul was one of the churches that kept him up. The Philippians, he writes them, and he, that's the only place in the intro where he uses the word joy. <laughs> Y'all are such a joy to me. Y'all are always looking for ways to support my ministry. Y'all are there for me when I need you. He writes to the Galatians, and he don't even give an intro. He just starts, like, gets right into it. Like, y'all, y'all mess it up. Let me, let me tell you how the ways you're messing up. Corinthians, he does give an intro. No mention of joy, but the first three chapters, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Because I think what Paul's saying is that the root of a lot of their issues is they don't truly understand wisdom. They don't truly understand power. He asks the question, where is the wise man of this age? He's thinking about a philosopher or a thinker here. Where is the scribe or the expert in the law? Perhaps a rabbi, perhaps a teacher of the law, the Jewish law, maybe someone well-versed in Roman law, but someone who knows how to navigate the do's and the don'ts. Where is the philosopher of this age, the debater? It was a lot different back then. They had sports, but they weren't like every day like we do. The most famous orators, the most famous debaters, they had profiles similar to what the greatest athletes of our day have. I don't think they had endorsement deals back then or commercials. No, I want to be like Mike, but it's an orator there speaking. But people knew who they were. Some of the more famous people. And even down to this day, you might not know who he is, but you might have heard the name Cicero. How did he become famous? Because he was a debater. A lot of times, if you got put on trial, it was really a debate. They'd have a debate, like especially if you were a more prominent Roman, they'd have a debate in the Senate over whether or not you were guilty. Let me tell you something. You wanted the truth on your side, but really what you wanted was the better debater on your side. You didn't want some dude off the street that didn't know how to debate or how to make an argument. I mean, you kind of think about like lawyers. Some of the richest people in our country are lawyers. And the best lawyers are also the wealthiest lawyers. Because people pay top dollar to make sure they got the best person arguing for them. Paul says, where are all these people? The thinkers. The people that know the law, the debaters, all these people that you hold up. He opposes wisdom, what he refers to as true wisdom, with folly or foolishness. Greek word there is moron. If you've ever called someone a moron, you've spoken Greek. Uh, that's where we get the word from. Um, now, don't call someone a moron and say it's in the Bible. I could use it. Uh, but that's that's the word he's using here. Moriah means foolishness or folly. He's saying there's true wisdom and there's true folly. And your mistake is that you think the people that the world thinks are wise are the ones that have true wisdom. When in reality, sometimes it's the most humble people. Perhaps even people that have been nailed to a cross that have true wisdom. To make his point, he's actually quoting a story from Israel's history. When he talks about, uh, in verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. He's quoting Isaiah 29, verses 13 and 14. We read, The Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. A lot of times Paul makes a point not only in the words that he uses, but where he chooses to pick those words from. He's quoting a passage in Isaiah that's right in the middle of Judah's having all these problems. They go, they they didn't see how things went with their cousins to the north, and it didn't end well. So they're saying, how are we going to, and this is key, save ourselves? So they start entering into talks to form this alliance with Egypt. And so what Paul is saying is, you remember when Judah was in trouble and they'd seen Israel fall? And rather than just simply turning to God and relying on God the whole way they had their whole history, the whole reason they existed is because they relied on God. But then when they got in trouble, you remember when they went running looking for other human saviors like Egypt? And, and really, it, it, it's kind of underneath the surface. He's saying, do you remember how that worked out for him? Spoiler alert, not so well. Egypt wasn't able to save them. Here come the Babylonians. 
the whole country is overrun and conquered. Jerusalem is besieged and then sacked. The temple is destroyed. The people are taken into exile. And Paul's basically saying that's where human wisdom got. Human wisdom said, let's formulate a plan to save ourselves or save ourselves in conjunction with these other people over here. And they never once stopped to think, maybe we could just turn to God. He's the whole reason we're here. He's the whole reason we exist. He's the whole reason we're a people. They kept saying, oh, we got, oh, we got a plan for this. Well, you can see Babylon and Egypt are enemies. So, you know, that human wisdom, they even still think this way in diplomacy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So if Egypt and Babylon are fighting each other, then I'll just side with Egypt. And that will be my protection. Didn't work so well. Human wisdom leads you to human solutions that were, interestingly, human problems. Why turn to human wisdom to get you out of a problem that human wisdom created? That's essentially what Paul is saying. That there is no wisdom when humanity is left to its own devices. He says the same thing at the beginning of Romans. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their own unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish, that word, folly, foolish, foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. <laughs> Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul says the whole reason that humanity is in this boat is because we exchanged the truth about God and the worship of God for the worship of the creator. We bought into this idea that we dug ourselves the hole and we'll dig ourselves out of it. When in reality, when we start digging, all we do is make the hole deeper. And Paul says, stop relying on human wisdom to fix a problem that it was human wisdom created. Gordon Fee says, a God discovered by human wisdom will be both a projection of human fallenness and a source of human pride. And this constitutes the worship of the creature, not the creator. So much of the wisdom that Paul's talking about, it's centered in the same society that worshiped gods Plural. To me, there's a philosophical problem there because you can't have multiple gods. You can't have multiple supreme beings. There's one supreme being. You're not supreme if you're sharing the top spot with other people. We don't play all these sports and they don't play a national title game and say, oh, it's a tie. Y'all can be co-champs. We created this whole playoff system because we got tired of the polling system where this team would claim to be champion. This They say, no, 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 we're going to play it until someone is clearly number one. It's the same thing. They, they thought of all these gods. And all the gods were was a projection of humanity. They had the same lusts, the same passions, the same desire for revenge. We just took ourselves and blew ourselves up and called ourselves all these names, like Jupiter or Zeus or Aphrodite. Paul saying, True wisdom recognizes that God doesn't look anything like us and act anything like us. See, what they're saying is the cross is the disqualifier because what type of God allows himself to be nailed to a cross? And Paul basically would say, a God that don't look nothing like you. And that's a good thing because you need someone that looks different to solve the problems that you have created. Leads us to a second, I think, simpler question. What is true power? He contrasts power with folly because any attempt on our part to exercise power outside of the cross is folly and it's going to end in failure, utility. So many people were hearing Paul's message and to them Christ crucified was an oxymoron. 
There's that word more of again, right? <laughs> it didn't make any sense. A Messiah, by their definition, couldn't be nailed to a cross. Because how can a man nailed to a cross save anyone? <laughs> Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Rather than dispute that, Paul says, you're absolutely right. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And that curse that Jesus bore was ours. That's what the wisdom and power of God were doing in the cross. They were working out a solution that we, left to our own devices, would never come up with. But we had a while to figure it out. And we couldn't. But that was, that was why it was a stumbling block. That word scandalon, where we get scandal from. He says it's a stumbling block because so many people, they can't wrap their mind around the idea that their Savior was nailed to a cross. Because by their judgment and their estimation, someone hanging on a cross, and that they had seen many of them, someone hanging on a cross is without power. And they might even say without wisdom because they wouldn't be on a cross if they had wisdom. They'd have figured out a way to get out of it. But the... The cross is a reversal of earthly values. If you look at the cross using the way the world has taught you to think, you won't understand its power and its beauty. But if you stop for a minute and say, earthly values is what got us in this mess. So maybe I need to flip the script. Maybe I need to reverse human values, earthly values, and look at it from God's perspective. And when you do that, suddenly you see that what God is doing in the cross is he's overpowering and outthinking us. Not, not overpowering us in the way that we think. He's overpowering us with love. Think about the story of the Roman Empire. I've said this many times. More money, more soldiers, more weapons. They were the strongest human power on earth. And when the word of the cross began to be preached... What did they do? They threw all their power and might at extinguishing it. But no matter how many Christians they killed, and that was the worst the Roman Empire could do, no matter how much might they exerted on trying to stamp out Christianity, three more rose up for each one they killed. Sociologists have done the study. Every time there was a persecution, by the end of the persecution there were more Christians rather than less. The world and the Roman Empire did its worst, used every power it had at its disposal to try to wipe Christians off the map. But these people who looked to the cross of Christ, they showed that the power of love and the cross could withstand everything the world could throw at When Jesus was nailed to that cross, few people would have said, there is power. But within a few hundred years, they were realizing that there was more power in the cross than you can ever imagine. I want to conclude by just saying, if you want to think about what is true wisdom and what is true power, if you want to know what it's not, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. It's not us. True wisdom is not found with us. True power is not found with us. In this passage at the very beginning, Paul basically divides humanity into two groups. He says there are those of us who are being saved, and those of us who are perishing, and those two groups are not distinguished by wealth or power or social status or ethnicity or any of the other things we like to use to divide ourselves up into little camps. And so here's my group, there's that group, there's, here's us, there's them. The distinction is simple. Those who are perishing are trying to save themselves. They are using their own wisdom. They are using their own power. And they are dying in the process. Those who are being saved have given up trying to save themselves. And even though it doesn't make much sense to them and they don't completely understand it, they see the cross and they're relying on the wisdom and power of God in the cross. Salvation has often been compared to a lifeboat. Those who have been saved by being pulled from the water those who are currently being saved as the boat heads for the shore, and then those who look to the shore and they, they see, they anticipate their salvation. Whether you're floating in the water as the lifeboat pulls up, whether you're being pulled into the boat, whether you're in the boat as it's headed to the shore, or whether you feel that boat slide up on the shore, 
All along that process, you're being saved. That's what Paul's talking about. But what's not happening is you're not saying, no thanks, I got it, as you try to swim the 50 miles yourself. That's really all, the, that's, that's the difference between perishing and being saved. One group thinks they can make the trip themselves only to sink under. And another group says, I need help. And they're lifted up into the boat. It's interesting, elsewhere, Peter, he kind of compares baptism and, and an entry into the church to the ark that goes through the waters, the flood. We talked about that when we looked at 1 Peter 3. And so what we see is the cross of Christ becomes to us like an ark that pulls us up out of the waters of sin and death and struggle to, struggling to save ourselves. It pulls us up and it begins the process of taking us safely to the shore. Are you trying to save yourself? That's the question I want you to wrestle with. And if you are, let me just ask you this. Where has your wisdom gotten you? you? You said, well, this is how I need to do things. This is how I need to prioritize things. Where's that gotten you? Well, I can do it. Didn't work the first, second, third, seventh, 47th time, but I can do it. I'll figure it out. If you're trying to save yourself, where has that gotten you? Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, if it is I who say where God will be, I will always find there a God who corresponds to me, is agreeable to me. But if it is God who says where he will be, that place is the cross of Christ. Aren't you glad that God wrote a different story? Aren't you glad that we rely on the wisdom of God as revealed to us through the cross of Christ? Aren't you glad that you don't have to save yourself through your own power or through your own wisdom, that you can look to the cross and recognize that the cross is the power of God? Maybe you're thinking, well, I don't deserve that. It ain't about what you deserve. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be there. If you could get to heaven without the cross, Jesus wouldn't have had to come here. It's not about what you deserve. It's about the fact that God loves you. And in the cross, he was revealing the power of that love. L.L. L. Wellborn says, in the cross of Christ, God has affirmed nothings and nobodies. It's kind of a summation of what Paul said. He writes in the same letter, God has used the weak, the people that everyone thought were ignorant, country bumpkins. He's used them to preach the gospel. Because you see, it's not about the power of the preacher or the eloquence of the it's not about the righteousness of those of us who come. It's about the cross. It's about the cross. That's the power of God. And the cross is even for the nothings and the nobodies. Because that's really what we have to become in order to embrace the cross. If we think there's any hope of saving ourselves, we won't come to the cross. But when we recognize that we are completely bankrupt when it comes to righteousness, when we cannot save ourselves, when we recognize that that righteously speaking, and that speaking of righteousness, we're a nothing, we're a nobody. That's where the avenue becomes open for us to embrace the power of God that is revealed through the cross. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Help us to understand that we cannot be saved through our own wisdom. We cannot be saved through our own power. Father, help us to look to the cross of your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that we will see your power there. A power that though the world sees it as weakness and folly, Father, that cross is a power which cannot be resisted. It reveals the depths of your love for us. Father, help us not only to look to the cross of Christ and your wisdom and your power that is displayed there, Father. And help us not only to look for it for salvation, but but help us to embrace the lifestyle of the cross. Father, help us not to see things the way the world sees them, but help us to see things through the lens of Jesus' cross. Father, thank you for saving us when we could not save ourselves. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song. If there's any way to help you, uh, maybe you've like, I've been looking at things all wrong. I've been using the world's wisdom. I've been trying to strive according to what the world refers as power. And I, and I realize I'm not going to save myself. 
I can't swim to shore, spiritually speaking. I need to look to the power and wisdom of the cross. If there's any way we can help you, encourage you this morning, we invite you to come as we stand, as we sing this song about the power of the cross in Jesus' blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's God. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the There is power, power, wonder, power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be water much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood, would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Uh, you can share what we talked about on social media. The cross of Christ is the power of God. He is 1, 18 through 25. Don't forget some of the things we mentioned. Uh, tonight we're going to continue looking at uh, the Messianic Psalms. Uh, there's a Psalm 69 uh, that kind of looks, it, it's kind of very similar to Psalm 22, but it comes up a lot in the Gospels and even in the book of Acts in reference to Jesus and once in reference to Judas. And so we'll look at that Psalm and how you kind of see Christ in that Psalm looking backwards at it. Um, of course, it was written hundreds of years before Christ came. Well, that's what makes it fascinating to me that so many of these Psalms that are hundreds, even a thousand years old, you look back and you see Christ in them. Um, so we're going to look at Psalm 69 tonight, and then we'll be looking at the parable of the wicked tenants, Mark chapter 12. Uh, Wednesday night, so join us at 6.30, we'll be eating barbecue chicken and sides, and then at 7 we'll be having our time of worship, study, and prayer together. Uh, a few other things coming up, don't forget, next, next week is Daylight Savings Time, and then, uh, those events are all mentioned in the bulletin. If you will, let's bow, and uh, Rocky will dismiss us in prayer. Hey, right? I'm right. I remember. I remember your name. Thank you. That's same. Right, okay, yeah. See, two saves. I remember that. I remember Hayden. Um, 